welcome to this consultant specialist interview. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Marina Ibrahim from Glow. Ability coaching. Marina specializes in coaching and training in global and inclusive leadership around culture and she talks about um, cultural ag agility which I think is a lovely term and hopefully we'll touch on that a little bit in our interview. So welcome Marina, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you Susanna, I'm pleased to be here and uh, yeah, look forward to our, our conversation. So we're talking culture today, so let's start by talking about what is culture? How do you define culture? Big question to kick us off. I know, I know, I know. Lots of people probably associate culture with going to the theatre or watching a nice film or a nice performance. Uh, in the context of business, we're talking about culture uh, in the context of, um, yeah, a complex um, uh, phenomenon, which often we don't really uh, get hold of because it's a very, very, um, you know, sophisticated um, thing, as we say. Often we use to explain culture uh, some metaphors, um, one of which one's comes into my mind is often a cultural iceberg or a tree even, because what is in common with these metaphors is we always have a visual part and an in, uh, unvis uh, invisible part. So it's literally what we can perceive with our senses is expressed, uh, expressive culture, something like, you know, listening to languages or uh, even certain behaviors, dress codes um, in the context of culture. Whenever we go into a different country for holidays, what we notice with our senses, the smells, everything is literally the, the, the tangible parts of culture. And then there are parts of culture which are not as visible to us or um, more or less hidden, like the roots of a tree or the hidden parts of an iceberg. And that is um, how we actually make decisions, for example. What are the sort of um, rules we, we abide by? Um, how, we, you know, how we teach our children, you know? All these elements which, we, which takes a long time to actually uncover and understand. And often they are you know, re literally unconscious to us. They are not really um, tangible unless you have the opportunity to familiarize with that culture. Um, may as well by you know an international assignment and you move to a different country and cultural context where you suddenly notice oh I can now compare with my own culture and then you become more aware of your own culture but also make want to make sense with a culture which is not so familiar to you. Often it takes a lot of time and uh, that's where me uh, myself and my, my, my expertise comes in um, by helping people to more or less get a you know, structural approach and understanding of how culture works and also give you more or less a, a shortcut to make sense of cultural differences and finding common grounds so that your cultural adaptation process um, makes more sense, but also helps you to familiarize yourself with a culture which is not so unknown, uh, not so known to you, and makes it easier for you to uh, navigate through those challenges involved with that. Thanks. So I really love um, those metaphors, you know, the iceberg and the the tree, and and that and that's true, isn't it? So you, you touched on kind of culture in terms of cultural differences geographically and across the globe. And if if you're to you know if you go on holiday, if you work across different cultures, but then you've got um, within business, you've got that complexity as well, haven't you? If you've got corporate culture that comes into play, and whilst global organisations may sort of have that that whole corporate culture across the board you're going to find differences in different countries with that as well and even within different offices in my experience yeah. you, you almost have like these little microcosms of, of culture as well what, what are your thoughts on, on absolutely that? yeah Susanna um yeah you're right uh, culture comes in different layers and um we are all you know every one of us is also you know, member of different cultural settings. When if if you if you if you think about you know being a member of a sports club or hobby um, class of some kind, these all have literally uh, subcultures. And yes, you're absolutely right. Within an organization, you have the corporate culture, which also cascades into different countries because often we deal in my work with multinationals who have literally subsidies in uh, uh, subsidiaries in different uh, countries. And the, even even if you had a, a corporate culture. 
sitting, let's say, as an umbrella over uh, overarching the whole corporate culture, you would still have some subtleties, uh, differencing uh, uh, differences in all different subsidi uh, subsidiaries because of the uh, element of um, localizing culture as well. So you can't just only um, say, oh, we have this corporate culture, we just have managed that everything is happening in all different countries. That's a bit of a, a big ask because um, it's often not, um, not as easy to implement it um, in a straightforward way. And with that comes absolutely all the different layers. You mentioned, um, let's say, uh, a branch, for example, but it can also be a departmental culture. It actually also has a lot to do what the functionalities of uh, the different departments are. So you will find, for example, uh, in an IT uh, organization, um, you would have the sales team perhaps be more people focused, whereas that's say the programmers um, team and the people who are dealing with software and implementation, for example, they would be more, um, you know, task focused and very much around the actual task at hand and uh, would already have a different way of communicating because then we would be having a different way of being more factual and really, um, you know, going down to the, um, the actual terminologies, uh, where sometimes the terminology is not very familiar to some of the clients. If you weave them in as a salesperson, uh, account manager uh, in the sales conversation. So you need to make sure that um, uh, your your um, your, uh, 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 your potential client would actually be able to understand what you're saying. Yeah, and I'm really glad you kind of came down to that, that department level because as you were talking, I was thinking about sort of the different cultures within departments and, and um, you know, we've talked before, we talked in the past about how I've got the, the seven pillars and what you've just said is that, um, you've really backed up that idea of that familiarization with an organ with the client organization up front to really understand you know, not only what's important to the organization as a whole, but also those different departments and so on, because that really can come into play, can't it, and have have a kind of an impact. And I think um, you know, where when I'm working with software companies, I, I try to get them to see that they're not selling software, they're selling change. And so and I think that leads us quite nicely on to because culture has an impact on the success of change, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a, a quite famous uh, um, saying by Peter Drucker, who's a management consultant uh, guru, really, uh, saying um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So whenever you want to uh, introduce um, change or any new strategy which comes uh, alongside with change, um, you have to really familiarize yourself with the culture first. You know, what, what is possible and how willing, for example, is an organization? Are the people you want to take with you? If they're not open to change, if there's a resistance there right from the start, how could you ever, uh, you know, try uh, to implement something which uh, people are not welcoming, maybe not even understand or don't see the purpose, the bigger picture behind it. So there's a lot of communication which needs to take place first and foremost to really connect with everyone who's, go who's going to be involved with that change, to really take them on board and also hearing their voices of concerns. They may as well say, you know, oh, we've done that in the past and we haven't been really successful with it, or they don't really understand understand what is you know the, what does the future look like it does it really make sense is everybody actually been involved with it so it's a it's a very complex undertaking it also means with every change you also have to change behaviors and yeah. habits and everything which is which comes with it the day to day and um, yeah how how can you actually make that dovetail with what is already in place without destroying what has already been in place so it's a it's a very very complex and uh, subtle uh, sort of um, approach needed to make sure that um, yeah everybody is on board in particular the culture piece how willing and uh, welcoming people are um, for let's say experiencing change and wanting to be a part of this is is a cultural piece yeah yeah and what I'm hearing from what you've just said is actually a big part of that is is building trust. Yeah. yeah so so absolutely. how how do we do that? How, in your view, how do we go around building trust, particularly with different cultures? Yeah. Well, let's let's step back and and literally come forward with a with a definition for culture because I spoke with sort of like a metaphorical um, pictures in the past. When you think about that, culture actually means 
their learned behavior patterns, for example, or um, unstated expectations. How often do you, for example, bring somebody into a, 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 as a new team member and um, you, you explain everything, this is how we do things, da, 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 but there are still aspects which are not explicitly outspoken. And how often does it actually take for somebody to, to, to learn about it, unless this person is, is, is quite patient and also a good uh, observer, for example, or is taken by somebody by the hand and say look and there are some rules which haven't really been you know outspoken some of them have just settled in some behaviors but they are just accepted or they they no, we, we've just inherited them or whatever mm -hmm. so culture is 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 all that it's also rules to live by or rules to work by yeah and culture is also uh, the, the trust determinate uh, determinants by what are the reasons why we trust each other how how does it come that we trust somebody and uh, we don't trust another person and these are the elements which comes with um, certain behavior expectations some certain courtesy some way how we communicate how we behave and also uh, what sort of competency is there, for example. So some cultures, and I have a background in, um, let's say, my cultural background is actually reflecting some of that, what I'm uh, dis uh, describing here. Um, my mother is German, my father is Egyptian, so I've already been brought up between some quite different cultures. Mm -hmm different in the sense of how we will trust, build trust, for example. In Germany, it's quite um, common that when you look into um, a, com a commercial setting, or let's say you apply for a role, for a job, you would really have to demonstrate your competency. And that is one of the key things everybody would be looking out for. When you uh, apply for a role, you have to demonstrate with a big, big folder of references and and um, all your, um, you know, your 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 school and and, and professional certificates you have achieved and the uh, endorsements uh, and recommendations by your employers. You literally have to demonstrate all that before you actually been invited to a, 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 a job interview. Whereas in Egypt, for example, um, just you know to describe. It's more important that the personality actually sits, you know, it, it, your, your personal qualities are more important and they look out, can we trust Marina in her person uh, before we actually go down to business? Yeah. So the relationship piece play, plays an absolute uh, crucial role. I mean, we're talking about uh, the trust and determination uh, uh, on the scale of, you know, are we more focusing on the competency and task orientation or more on the relationship orientation? So these are just as an example, um, two contrastive cultural approaches. And there are many cultural uh, approaches in between who maybe have some mixtures as well. So it's not all black and white. But what I'm aiming at is um, to look out what, what are your own trusted uh, uh, components, which, which, which um, uh, you know, literally um, help you to describe how, on which grounds are you trusting somebody to make business with or um, apply, uh, 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 employ somebody, bring somebody into the team? How would they be introduced? These are all aspects which literally sit on how can we build um, trustful relationships if we don't know where to start? Yeah. yeah. And one of the elements which I just described, let's say, um, on based on competency or based on relationship um, is one of the key starting points. But there are many more, uh, which then also comes into cultural profiling, where you can literally get a better understanding that there are more elements to building trust than only uh, based on um, is that person competent enough to do the job and being reliable uh, based on the competency or is that person also reliable based on relationship? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that you um, you use that example, actually, because there, there's that common phrase, isn't there, of um, recruit for attitude, train for skill. But I think what it's easy to forget is that that wouldn't necessarily be the case yeah. in every culture. And, you know, every um so global culture but also every organization you know different organizations may not take that approach depending on what kind of business they're in because there will be certain um industries where actually the the skills the competence that proof of qualifications will be yeah. critical and yeah. actually that would possibly come as a higher priority 
than like you say the the relationship side of things so that's really interesting and I, I think um it's interesting as well because you thinking about sort of software companies and going out there you know it's not just about well are we trying to roll this out to a, a company that's got an, an office in say Germany or Egypt or so on. I think because because people are so geographically mobile now yes. you're going to get these influences wherever so just having that awareness is is really important to think actually we can't treat everybody the same and you know, that's that's probably a bigger conversation anyway but that whole yeah okay well what kind of things do we but need to bear in mind and how can we be sort of quite balanced about this but but also maybe that whole understanding of what the overriding culture might be to to be able to understand those and the way we do things around here and then some of like you said that that invisible stuff that you kind of need to delve a little bit deeper of, oh, well, they say this, but actually the organisation works like this and it's really important that we bear that. Yeah, two things two things come into mind here, um, Susanna, and this is really imp- uh, uh, interesting to, to mention here. Um, often we get carried away with what is common sense. We're thinking about, oh, you know, we, the way we do things here must apply everywhere else because, you know, we have developed this and uh, we have practiced it for many, many years. And therefore, that's how it is. And that's exactly the pitfall which we are talking about when it comes to interacting with different cultures and also different, um, um, well, different organizations and even people. You, you mm-hmm. mentioned that um, as soon as we are stepping out into the virtual world and that we are nowadays particularly through the pandemic, it has actually shown we are exposed to um, so many different cultures and, and literally diverse um, audience and, and, and um, you know, customer base that we have to really uh, make sure that what we are anticipating as being right is going to be questioned by everybody else who is in the virtual room with you because they may as well have a complete different perspective. And just by the sake of uh, saying, oh, that's what, how we always did it, it's not justifying the common sense approach. It actually will be challenged. You will be challenged all the way through. And that awareness is one of the key, um, um, well, say, um, uh, foundations, really, for you to interact um, in, in, in any context with different uh, uh, potential clients um, with, you know, project managers in, uh, you know, account managers, cl- any any settings, departments you would want to interact with uh, for the for the sake of having a productive and, and successful relationship. So creating that awareness means you have to be inclusive mm-hmm. first and foremost, rather than exclusive by saying, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. Inclusive means Let's look into jointly finding a way how we can find common ground, understanding, and also willingness to be open and and interested for the other person's perspective. And that takes some some learning and yeah. some understanding, some deeper understanding. Yeah, it, it, and it it's it's not necessarily kind of obvious or in the forefront of people's minds, is it? But but actually, it is really really important so yeah yeah. so so you touched already on um the the sort of the the task versus relationship sort of dimension so are there some other dimensions of culture that you think might come into play in terms of say a software implementation project or a change project you know dimensions that we need to be thinking about yeah, I mean, um, based on the trust, how we build trust, um, yes, um, when you look into task orientation or relationship orientation, maybe be one of the most um, obvious ones, because we notice that already by the way how people communicate. There are people who tend to be communicating quite um, direct in the way of being factual. They say what they mean and mean what they say. And there's no sort of you know room to maneuver because you know there's no room for small talk or, you know, softy kind of, um, you know, um, uh, how is the weather and how are you and how's the family and all this. This is very typical for, for, you know, relationship oriented cultures who really want to establish the atmosphere and the the harmony uh, 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 between, um, you know, between people, which is first and foremost um, attached to relationship oriented cultures. They want to really see, you know, can I trust this person on their personality basis? 
and that also expresses itself with um yeah, with with the um, uh, with the way how we communicate. Yeah, often there's some frustration uh, because when we see the more di indirect uh, communication style, um, is you know you look out for for more um, you know wordy a wordier communication. Yeah, there's more as I said you know we're doing small talk and um, as there's um, less focus on the subject matter, but you know may maybe more circular way of communicating yeah we're talking about um you know uh, asking questions around um you know everybody else in the team you know rather than on the actual subject matter so this is often the frustration between a direct uh, a, a person or a culture who is talking more in a direct communication style versus um someone who is more indirect there's a frustration between those two what guess what would they think about each other yeah, just the question about how um, a direct con uh, 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 communication culture would think, oh, they're so wordy, you know, what did they actually say in the end, you know, uh, can they not be more specific and, oh, you know, we lost so much time around that. There's that frustration around it, whereas the other indirect communication culture would say about the direct ones, you know, do they not have any heart? Are they not interested in me? They're only interested in my subject, in my, in my, in this, in this, uh, in this task at hand. Uh, you know, uh, what have I done? You know, am I really someone who is, you know, only being functionalized? So, you know, these are the frustrations which come in place into place when you have that culture clash. Mm -hmm. between those two different communication styles and that can easily um destroy trust yeah so it would be it would be devastating if those two cultures wouldn't have a toolkit to understand hey these are our preferences but when we really want to be working together we want to really understand what it takes for us to move maybe a little bit from the direct communication style and have a little bit of interaction on a relationship oriented communication style, whereas the indirect communication style may as well also move a little bit more towards, you know, what are the direct communication uh, style um, uh, representatives are actually talking about, you know, maybe we can prepare our meetings being more focused or these, you know, having a little agenda here, rather than just being sort of like floating um, around, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, one key uh, element, uh, you know, talking about um, the way how we communicate and with it, which has already touched upon was the time element. You know, there are cultures who have a very flexible approach to time and others are really very, very time sensitive. You know, just imagine you would, um, you know, and again, I can bring that example for uh, time flexible cultures that tend to be also cultures who have a very big emphasis on, on relationships. So the relationship really um, has a very uh, important focus, but that means also we have to spend time with each other in order mm -hmm. to build deeper relationships, whereas cultures who are more task oriented have a very yeah, well, they, they have an approach and concept that time is really valuable, time is money, don't waste my time. So they express that also in their attitude and the way how they communicate, um, making it time efficient. Um, every meeting needs to be, you know, um, set out with a cl clear agenda and um, maybe even 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 at every um, touch point, every agenda point would be, um, you know, allocated with some certain amount of time and then we move on and so on and so forth. So that's that's another aspect there. Hierarchy plays another important role here, because particularly when it comes to project management, and we know that um, in IT we have project management um, tools at hand, but often when you think about a project, um, let's say simplified a project into um, having aspects such as, um, well, particularly when how we work together, is um, when it comes to um, having a planning phase and uh, an actual decision making phase and an implementation phase, that's a very simplified uh, project management structure. Even there, you can see how culture can impact each uh, individual of these three phases. So if you had, um, you know, uh, a culture who is, for example, more risk averse, yeah, they would really pay a lot of attention to the actual planning phase. They want to really make sure everything is in place. Have we got have researched all the aspects uh, which you know as information we needed? 
We can also look into aspects such as, um, you know, uh, risks. Um, have you considered all the risks, uh, for example? So that can all go into the actual planning phase. And then may as well, on the basis of that, um, you can look into hierarchy, for example, how much hierarchy then also plays an important part in the in a stage of making decisions. How many people are involved in the decision making process? What sort of you know hierarchy is there involved? Is it sort of like a, a deep hierarchy where lots of uh, decision making um, uh, 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 levels are involved? Or is it more based on, um, you know, um, uh, uh, competencies and where flat hier hierarchies um, help making decisions much more quicker. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard about from the hierarchy point of view that um, you know you get the influence, don't you, when you're in meetings or, for example, when you were delivering a training that only sort of say the managers in certain cultures only the managers would speak and because everyone would wait for the manager to speak because that's the culture and so it can be quite difficult to get the input from so you know using the software example you're rolling out software and you're trying to get input from all the users but actually their culture is that you know almost like their opinion doesn't count that's not the case but they won't speak because I don't know, they, they've got to wait for their manager to speak and and so I don't, do, do you then say, OK, well, during the rollout, we'll make sure that the managers are, are trained separately so that we can have the other. So we haven't got those hierarchies. Absolutely. And again, and again that, that could come into play in an organisation in terms of departments. If you've got quite a, a strong leader in a department who's got that sort of quite authoritative style and actually people are quite wary of raising their views in front of the manager again that that can have an impact you know even in a, in a kind of single culture organization actually you, you've got to watch Absolutely. out for those things haven't you so it's understanding almost those individual personalities um as well as the the, the bigger picture Yes, absolutely. Well, um, well described here, Susanna. Um, yeah, the leadership style or the, the hierarchical style um, really expresses itself as well in the way how you actually run any decision making um, processes, how you how you run meetings, who actually has the right to say something in particularly high, deep hierarchical um, structures and cultures. You will find that the only one who has uh, the right to have an opinion and not being questioned um, from that leadership uh, position, uh, in, in, in their leadership position. That means also that nobody else has the right to speak. And that is very dangerous for anything which is involved with change. We, we talked about change um, previously, because then those opinions which matter um, may as well be never heard. And that can be very um, dangerous to any leadership, um, because if the leader is, you know, um, a con you know, a, a competent person, OK, that's fine. But often leaders may as well also need to have that input from their um, from their team, in particular in, in today's um, fast paced and very complex um, VUCA world, uh, if I may say so, uh, VUCA as the uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity uh, of 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 our complex world and um, the challenges involved with making decisions, you have to make sure that you have the best um, information ready to make decisions. And that can only happen if you have a team which helps you to, to support um, being well informed and having um, different perspectives there. Again, the diversity of, of, of thought and the diversity of, uh, of, of opinions and perspectives is so crucial nowadays. So you can't really afford uh, to um, to have a one dimensional leadership style anymore, uh, but often um, you know organizations get carried away with um, the things how they always have been done and yeah. the common sense approach, and that is exactly what um, will be challenged when when changes are uh, necessary or changes are due. And those changes just doesn't come just around the corner. They they also are willingly uh, decided for. Uh, to stay competitive and to introduce, let's say, new ways of working because um, the need is there in order to stay competitive and um, offer the best service to your clients, the best software to the clients. Yeah. As you were talking, what sprung to mind was um, uh, an image that I've used and it it kind of talks about how sort of through change you've got um, two sort of branches that go off and 
and one um, kind of heads you towards compliance whereas the other one heads you towards commitment and actually what I was hearing from what you were saying is that with with some of those leadership styles that you were describing you might get the compliance so you might get the users using the software because if they don't there will be consequences but it's quite a negative thing you know it's not that they're actually committed to using it and they don't see the value for themselves because they've not been involved in that process they've not been able to voice their opinions they've not been able to sort of share what they think will work won't work you know um, and and I think that's really important for for people that is sort of a <laughs> the expression we use in the the UK is the coal face so those people that are doing the the, the day-to-day work and you know, using um, that software product in their daily lives, you know, they're the ones that really understand, but actually someone higher up that maybe isn't that close to what they do in a day's job is making those decisions for them. You can see where you get those tensions, can't you? Yeah, tensions and frictions. I mean, you know, when in the end of the day, um, yes, there's maybe that personal frustration there, but we must not forget in the end of the day, we are running a, an operation, we are running a business and all the uh, pitfalls which we're just describing here, um, they literally burn money uh, for, yeah. <laughs> first and foremost. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is how it is. I mean, the friction, the time you're losing, the frustration, and also, let's say, delays which are caused by implementation of software, for example, and all the adjustments which need to be done, if they're not um, in- inclusive in terms of, you know, having those people who have to um, work with it on a daily basis, feeding back, you know, oh, we are experiencing this and we want to be heard about this uh, challenge and problem. Um, it, it, it literally holds up the project. It will hold up all the opportunities of making that software um, workable and uh, applicable and also uh, practical for, 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 for the client. Um, that frustration is, is, is literally um, there to, um, to be also commercially um, hurtful. Mm. Losing time, losing um, losing money, losing um, maybe also potential clients, um, you know, the clients of the client as well, as well as maybe even workforce. Yeah. And nowadays, I mean, if you see that there's a frustration in the workforce um, not being heard or even um, included in, 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 in the, the way of how, how, uh, how we can work, then um, it's literally um, um, something which I think no organization nowadays can afford to lose um, because recruitment is expensive and also takes a lot of time to actually bring up people to that knowledge um, uh, about the company and the way how things work. Uh, that knowledge is lost uh, when you lose um, a, 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 a member of staff. And um, yeah. So is now is now a good time to kind of bring in the idea of psychological safety? Because, you know, that whole, you know, people feeling psychologically safe within their work roles and so on you know you, you'll, you'll describe it better than me so because you know it's it's becoming and um, as far as I'm aware it's becoming of increasing importance but I'm still not sure that people really know what it is and understand what it is and what it's in important why it's important so you want to talk about that a little bit Marina yeah sure um I see that uh, psychological safety is literally uh, describing how safe do you feel um, in within your team, within your organization, to bring the whole self to your to, to work, really. Um, and if if the um, culture uh, at that organization is actually inclusive enough to be able to respect everybody's opinion and allow every uh, everybody's um, ways of working to be accepted and respected. Because um, just as an example, and that could also be another way of inclu- in introducing another cultural dimension, how we give feedback, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because the way how we give feedback also reflects the way how we um, allow ourselves within that organization, within that team, um, to make mistakes or how mistakes are actually taken. Are they really taken as mistakes or are there actually an error which is, you know, unforgivable? You know, mm-hmm. the way how we deal with the, the, the with mistakes and how we give feedback um, to our um, team members who made mistakes. Is it a learning opportunity or it's an absolute disaster that, um, you know, is almost like, you know, everybody needs to be punished for it um, by, you know, really getting a, a bit, um, you know, uh, uh, the stick uh, uh, as it were 
were the, 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 the feedback stick with negative feedback, as it were, or is it um, welcomed to use every mistake as an opportunity to learn from? And again, that also brings us into the sphere of, 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 um, of agility, because agility allows to learn from mistakes quicker because nobody has the time to do all the mistakes themselves. Yeah. So how can we actually leverage every mistake, for example, particularly when it comes um, in this case, um, you know, any software development where you can literally say, oh, I've tried this one, but I can also uh, say this doesn't work to share that with the group and say, you know, what are your perspectives? Um, you know, what are your experiences with this? Is opening up the opportunity to learn from that mistake without shying away and saying, well, I can possibly not share that with, um, you know, with everybody because then I will be found out or, um, you know, um, uh, I will, you know, I will get um, negative feedback or even, you know, told off for it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying is psychological safety where you can openly talk about um, you know, approaches and your opinion is going to be heard. You can share your mistakes without um, getting told off for the purpose of learning about uh, learning, learning from it. And literally also another opportunity to um, to to progress faster with the learning than, um, you know, when lots of you know frustration is, is, is involved and you give somebody feedback and that person starting to feel really bad about and have a bad, you know, bad day and bad mood and not feeling accepted and respected. And that friction in itself uh, causes a lot of, um, you know, valuable um, uh, loss, really, in terms of um, feeling um, that you can be progressive and, 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 and successful with any um, interchange. So that's, that's what I mean with uh, psychological safety, allowing people to speak up about, you know, any, anything which is re relevant to um, to the organization, to the work, uh, to the to the way of working, and um, yeah, being there to be, you know, to contribute um, yeah. in the best way. I've got um, I've got a, a personal example of that actually, and it's it's from quite a while back, and um, I remember I was working for an organization, and we were actually buying. Um, a new system so I was involved in the project team I was representing so it was a, a global thing and I was representing um, my team in Europe um, and um, we um, yeah we we'd gone through all of the requirements you know we'd done a lot of effort we'd um, kind of reviewed a number of organizations with the product and we'd we'd chosen the one that we felt was best suited to to our requirements you know that was taking all of the users into account and so and the, and the different ways of working across the world um, and then unfortunately purchasing got involved and I think this is very simplified version and I wasn't involved in the original discussions, but the simple, simplified version was the purchasing department said to the supplier, well, have you got anything cheaper? And the supplier said, well, yeah, we've got this version of the product here that's cheaper, which is what ended up getting bought, which didn't have any of the functionality that we needed to be able to do what we need to do across the world. Um, and the, the project team and certain members, they did speak up because they they felt comfortable and it they very quickly got to the point where they didn't feel comfortable anymore saying anything. And unfortunately, you know, there was there was quite a lot of um unrest, I suppose, and, and that that trust was lost and then other people sort of started to feel like well I share the views of these people that have already spoken out but actually now I don't feel comfortable speaking out um, and so those people that had already spoken out felt like they'd been left on this sort of island because everybody else backed down a bit because they didn't want to to put themselves out there and be at risk of and, and it, it was quite a difficult time and it the project team did an amazing job and we all worked together and we got something sorted out but but as an experience I suppose that's the thing I take that experience um, and go the companies I work with software companies I don't want them to be that supplier that turns around and goes oh yeah well we've got this this cheaper product here I would have wanted that supplier to turn around and say Yes, but with all the work we've done with your team, yes, while we've got this cheaper product here, that's not going to meet their needs. And so it's not worth you buying that. 
I know maybe there's something that you can do with the slightly more expensive version, but we need to tweak that. But you need to bring everybody, all those stakeholders, back into that conversation and go, well, actually, we've only got this budget. What can we do for this budget? Rather than sort of all of that hard work basically being thrown out of the window and losing people's trust almost overnight. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. 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 <clears throat> I mean, this is this brings us probably always... Um, into the um, sort of um, uh, arena of, um, you know, that we're not selling um, our products and services only based on pricing. Um, There should always be an added value. Um, You know, how can what we are actually um, introducing uh, in any consultancy context, you know, how can we add value um, to the business and not just only saying, you know, here's a you know, off the shelf solution. Um, I mean, yeah, there may as well be off the shelf solutions, but when as soon as it comes into bespoke um, uh, services and 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 products, there's that element of wanting to understand the needs. And you can only learn about understanding those needs if you have cultural and communication skills um, uh, uh, and an inclusive mindset. That's what I what I you know preach let's say um uh, in terms of um, that you have to have a certain attitude you can always sell yes you can you know on the basis of prices perhaps if you know the, the price pain points of your prospective clients fine but do they really get the solution they wanted um do they really get the transformation they they aimed at um that's something which you want to find out when you have those um you know deeper conversations with with your clients or prospective clients um and that means also you need to know what you're talking about and you need to know what is doable and that also means you have to have you know that communication um background with your own team you know knowing you know what they can do what they can't do or where the frictions might be um meaning it's a it's an inside out approach that's what i'm saying you know it's um for me it's the it probably is no longer just only cultural diversity it's called cognitive diversity mm-hmm. so allowing all the different ways of thinking and working to to be brought to the table to really understand and what is doable and what you can actually um, achieve when you know what maybe um, uh, what ideas uh, are floating around in your team, as well as when it comes to sitting down with your with your prospective client. You've made a really good point, And actually, it feels like quite a nice point to end. I'm sure we could talk for, for hours. But that whole thing about actually software adoption and customer loyalty and customer advocacy aren't built on price are they, those are built on relationships, they're built on, you know, really that understanding of of the customer and their needs, and like you say, providing that value. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much. Likewise, yeah, Yeah. thank you for for all these lovely uh, questions as well, which gave me uh, the opportunity to also highlight what is important. Yeah, and I wish you and your clients um, all the best successes and uh, yeah, long-term relationships uh, are based on all those um, aspects which we talked about today. Thank you. Thank you. And what I'll do is I'll put all of your contact details um, and any sort of appropriate links in the notes for, for the video so people can get in touch with you directly if they want to discuss culture in further detail. Thank Thanks you, again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.